on here with the Chatham Journal. I've got Kevin, is it Roche? Roche? Is Roche. That? Roche. Okay. Kevin Roche. I should have asked him that before we went live. Of the healthy skeptic, uh, runs a blog, has a long history in, in the medical field. I love his blog. He's given us permission to reprint some of his articles in the Chatham Journal, and you've been able to read those on site. Uh, the fact that the reason we've got him on this morning is to just talk about COVID and taking a look at it from a data perspective. Uh, hey, what do we need to be doing? Uh, what's the situation now that we have vaccines? Uh, what are considerations that you need to take into mind when you're dealing with vaccines? Uh, but I think in the last few weeks, actually in the last few months, the big deal that I've got away from Kevin's blog is the fact that COVID is here to stay and we need to deal with it. So starting from that premise, Kevin, can you kind of elaborate on, hey, it's been 18 months where at this point we've got this and that, and here's what we need to do to be able to deal with COVID since it's here to stay. Yeah, I I, I think um, if you kind of read even a little bit about respiratory virus epidemics, um, one of the things you observe is that they really can't be suppressed, that you can't get to what some people refer to in this epidemic as COVID zero. Um, you know, that just doesn't happen. Uh, and that's true whether it's flu, we have seasonal coronaviruses, we have rhinoviruses, we have adenoviruses, we have RSV, which is actually quite dangerous to children. And um, all of those pathogens have been around forever and they're gonna be around in one form or another. So the notion, um, which was somewhat unique in this epidemic that we ought to try to completely suppress it um, I think was futile, number one, and number two has resulted in a lot of damage both to the public health um, and to the economic situation of many people, the educational situation. Uh, I, I think we're seeing in some parts of the world a recognition and acceptance of this. The Scandinavian countries, which I think have been more enlightened in general, have all basically said, we're done with the epidemic. Um, you know, it's going to be here at some background level. We'll just deal with that. But we're not kind of putting restrictions on what people do. Other European countries are moving that way. I think we have states here, um, Florida might be an example, um, that are moving in that direction. And and I, it's an attitudinal kind of thing as much as anything. We, we need to recognize that we've done what we can pretty much to mitigate the effects of the virus. The virus is not going away. People just need to understand that these things don't magically disappear or all get killed. They have reservoirs. They have ways of persisting that we don't even understand. Um, so it's going to be here. We've adapted pretty well, frankly, to its presence. And I think at this point, we need to just um, return to letting people uh, make their own decisions about what actions they do or don't take. I think one of the things I've also enjoyed about reading your content is you you pulled in there seems to be a few folks on Twitter that actually put the data into the graphics forms that kind of allows you to understand if you're willing to pay attention to it as to who COVID affects the most. So uh, why don't you let folks know, again, who who's most affected by COVID, uh, age group, um, health conditions, all sorts of different variables. I, I think there's enough data out there after 18 months that you do a good job on your site of, of letting folks know, hey, here's, here's, the, who, here's the groups that are most affected by it. Yeah, obviously, I'm most familiar with, and I have a collaborator. I am not uh, a technical Excel genius, so I have a collaborator who helps me um, actually put things into charts. And I think one of the most enlightening sets of charts that we put out regularly is what we call kind of the age structure. 
which kind of shows the level of testing of cases of hospitalizations and of deaths for each age group. But it's actually been apparent since the very start of this epidemic. You may recall there was uh, a cruise ship in Japan on which one of the early kind of extensive outbreaks occurred. And if you look at the data from that cruise ship, um, you could tell even then that this was going to predominantly be a source of serious disease in the in the older population and in particular in the frail elderly. And that continues to be borne out. Uh, the risk of death for people over 80 is literally several thousand times what it is for um, people in younger age groups. Uh, so both hospitalizations and especially deaths are concentrated in the very old, especially the frail elderly, often in nursing homes. Um, and in the rest of the population, it's concentrated in people with serious health conditions, uh, you know, including the cluster of diseases that are typically associated with obesity. Um, interestingly, and you see this very clearly in the Minnesota data, we just did another set of charts that will be published today. Uh, after vaccination, in the first um, three months or so after vaccination, when vaccination started here with the elderly obviously being prioritized, we had sort of a case wave in the spring. In that case wave, the proportion of deaths among the elderly was actually very suppressed. We had a recent kind of case wave about the same size as the April one. It looks like it's just rolled over in the last couple of weeks here. In that wave, we have returned to the earlier age structure where a lot of the deaths are in the very old. And I attribute, these are vaccinated people. The vaccines just lose their effectiveness. And, and that's not unexpected, especially in old people. So it's, it's what I have referred to from the start as this incredibly bifurcated epidemic with the, the serious disease and bad outcomes concentrated in the very elderly. Uh, you mentioned that the elderly, the vaccination wears off. Is that true of pretty much any vaccine for any type of virus? Because yeah, it's it, it's an immune system. It's just an immune system. It's, it's the nature of the immune system. And it isn't just vaccines. If you are very old and not in great health and you get a cold, the adaptive immune response you have to that cold isn't going to be as strong as it would be in a 30-year-old. So it, it's, it's a very well-established uh, phenomenon in the research that um, old people, and again, especially those who aren't very healthy, um, have poor adaptive immune responses to any kind of challenge, including from vaccines. Um, and those responses that they do have not only aren't very strong, but they don't last as long. So I, you know, I, I think the public messaging um, around vaccines has been, has really been pretty bad, bad uh, in the sense of setting expectations that just, just weren't supported by what we know about how vaccines work. And people should have been told, you know, a vaccine doesn't stop exposure to the virus. It doesn't stop some level of infection. And in old people, it's probably not going to prevent a lot of deaths that, that occur. Uh, here in North Carolina, the governor Mask mandates are not required on a state level. However, certain municipalities, and here in Chatham County, one of our towns, Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh mayor, who's, who falls into that over 65 category, has passed a mask mandate, uh, which, quite honestly, is kind of adhered to and not adhered to. Um, but you mentioned the older folks. Let, let's talk about masks. Um, and we have a sizable elderly population here in, in Chatham County, over 65. And, and our number of deaths in the entire Chatham County over nine, uh, over 18 months 
has been about 90. And most of those deaths happen within the first few months in two nursing homes, as you mentioned, the elderly are super susceptible to it. Uh, I think that our other local paper, Chatham News and Record, did a search for the, to, through the death records and found that the youngest death of someone, a Chatham County resident, was like 55. Uh, so what's your feeling? Should, should elderly people be wearing masks when they're going out? What's the efficiency of masks? Is it no mask, yes mask? What's the benefits? I mean, you put out a lot of content as to masking. Um, you know, what's your feeling on masking? When does it help? When doesn't it help? And, uh, you know, on an ongoing case, if we're living with COVID for it's here and it's here to stay, are masking mandates even... I mean, is it really not necessary to have those? Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to encourage people not to wear masks. I think people should do whatever they want. I don't, I, I would be concerned that people get a false sense of security because the reality is they don't work very well. Um, in an isolated instance, they might prevent transmission either from a wearer or to someone who's wearing a mask. Um, over a large number of transmission opportunities, they don't work very well. And you can see that in any um, data or chart uh, that you look at. And I don't pay as much attention to the whether or not there's a mandate as to data about how often people are actually wearing masks. And you know, here in Minnesota, we had a statewide mask mandate for a very extended period of time. We had 90% plus uh, mask wearing adherence um, during uh, most of that time. And last fall, we had a horrific uh, wave of, of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Um, and masks obviously had zero impact on that. And I try to explain to people, you always look at stuff on a micro level and a macro level. At a micro individual level, when you look at what's happening, um, you know, masks don't stop transmission because virus and virus particles and aerosol particles that the virus is on um, are very small. Uh, the whole purpose of a mask is to collect those particles. Um, so there on the mask, there was a study in England that looked at how long the virus persisted in a viable form on various surfaces. And the second longest persistence was actually on mask surfaces. So, you know, you're collecting virus if you are exposed on the mask, there are gaps it can eventually be pushed or pulled through the mask. The best kind of modeling studies that look at the wearing of masks over long periods of time and what happens to various particles around the mask show that masks in some ways actually concentrate uh, opportunities for the virus to be either inhaled or exhaled. So from a physical perspective, most masks that people are using just, you know, don't really have the capability to stop transmission. And as I said, then you look at the macro level and what you observe um, in any well done kind of data or research uh, study is that there's not an impact on, on transmission. But again, I don't care if people wear them. I don't think they should be mandated because there isn't evidence to support any beneficial effect. But people who are uh, concerned and who think it's going to help them should wear them. I, I would, if you're that worried, I, I think the better advice is stay out of high risk situations than uh, assume you're going to protect it because be protected because you're wearing a mask in them. Uh, staying with the older population, um, and, and before we get to that, what's your definition of a high risk situation? Well, obviously, you know, if you're around people who appear to be sick, I, I, you know, my guidance for keeping myself healthy, aside from getting vaccinated, which I've, which I've done, has been to avoid kind of crowded situations with people I don't know, um, because you, you just don't know if there's a person there 
transmission in this epidemic, as in many epidemics, appears to be primarily from people who are often referred to as super spreaders. A relatively small percent of the population appears to have pretty high viral loads to be expelling pretty high amounts of virus. Uh, and those people are probably accounting for a very high percent of all transmission. That may actually be one factor that accounts for the shape of waves that we see. Uh, so I, I, you know, I tend to, I go to restaurants and stuff, but I, I tend not to go to very crowded bars with a lot of people I, I don't know. Um, so I think you just kind of use common sense, but I, I've pretty much lived a normal life through the whole um, epidemic. Uh, I think it's I think it's really just kind of common sense. Uh, well, that's a good piece of advice there. What other advice? And, and I know there are folks that are genuinely concerned in our community, especially the over 65 years old that uh, you know, some of them have stopped seeing their grandkids. They've stopped interacting with family members. It sounds like some of the suggestions you're saying is uh, you can interact safely with folks that you know. If they happen to be sick, maybe they need to stay home and not eat, come into contact with you. But what other what other advice could you give to somebody that's over 65 years of age? Yeah. I mean, unless you're really severely immunocompromised, you know, or taking some medicine that just really suppresses your immune system or have a disease that does that, I, my, my advice to anyone is keep living your life as much as you can. I can't imagine not seeing my grandchildren or family, and I did throughout this. Um, and I, I do think that's relatively low risk because you're trusting them to tell you if they've either been exposed um, or are, are, are feeling uh, sick. Um, and there have been a couple of, of examples of situations where a, a member of my family has uh, thought they were exposed. In one case, I actually did get infected and we kind of all stayed apart for a while. So I, I think being cautious like that, but I, I hate to see people give up what's important uh, in life. Um, so I, w I wouldn't do that. The other thing I would encourage people to do is get themselves in as good a health as they can. You know, eat healthy, uh, exercise. Um, you know, if you've got a known, um, you know, bad health condition, do your best to keep it under control because it is pretty clear that that people who are healthy don't tend to get uh, seriously, seriously ill. So as with everything, maintaining good general health probably helps you as much as anything. I wouldn't be obsessive about cleaning. The, the research shows it, it, you know, wiping stuff down all the time doesn't seem to make much difference. Those plastic barriers don't seem to make much difference. Social distancing, doesn't seem to make much distance, primarily because it appears that the virus has capability to kind of persist in the air and travel a lot further than than we think. So, you know, a lot of stuff that people recommend doesn't necessarily work. What's the data that you see on being indoors and being outdoors? Uh, differences, uh, my wife's a nurse and she says, hey, Outdoors is probably one of the, the best environments to be in. Um, what's the yeah, name I, of this thing? I think that's probably true. And I think the data pretty much shows there's very limited um, examples of outdoor transmission. And um, that, that would um, likely be partly because sunlight, frankly, kills the virus. So if you're out in the sunlight, um, there, you know, even if the virus is around, it may not last long. Airflow will probably disperse the virus um, more quickly. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you're a lot safer outdoors than you are indoors uh, in, in general, I would say. Um, we touched on the elder, elderly. Uh, it seems that right now there's uh, a vaccine that's going to be close to being approved if it hasn't been approved for the five to 12 year old age group. Um, you've written quite a bit on the healthy skeptic about 
how this has affected kids, not just from a health perspective, but from a learning perspective, uh, child abuse perspective. Also, there's all sorts of negatives because it seems that our leadership in, in, in lo localities and states and in the nation have overreacted to a certain extent. Uh, what are you seeing from a how does how does COVID affect kids? I, I know they they mentioned that um, cases have gone up, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's more deaths, and also kids are more asymptomatic. I mean, you've got loads of information on your website to to get it concise and to let the folks in Chatham County know about how COVID affects kids and what you see as a healthy perspective to to COVID and kids. Can you give us something a little bit concise? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's very clear. I think I don't think anybody disputes children are at extremely low risk of any kind of serious illness um, from coronavirus, and that's partly because they constantly are suffering seasonal coronavirus and infections, and it appears that those prior seasonal coronavirus infections actually help with the immune response to the current uh, strain. So there is basically to a healthy child, there really is zero risk of any kind of serious disease. Um, obviously, children who have serious health health issues can can be at risk. So you start there for kids themselves. There's very little risk. Um, Doing things like keeping kids out of school or having virtual school, the research all shows that's just very damaging to children, not just from a um, uh, an educational perspective where we're just seeing kids both drop out of school, especially minorities, um, but also lose years of, of learning, um, but it also hinders their social development. Um, and uh, some of the stuff we've imposed on children in the name of safety uh, is actually damaging them. So it's not actually very safe. In terms of uh, vaccines and children, I think we need to be super cautious because of the low risk. If there's any number of serious adverse events in children from the vaccine, um, then it's more dangerous to them than the virus itself. So I personally, um, you know, think we need some really large, significant studies to be sure we understand the safety risk to children. Um, and then, you know, I would be very unhappy to see mandates about vaccinating uh, children, you know, parents, I think can make an assessment of the risk to their, the comparative risk to their child from disease and from vaccination. Um, and, uh, you know, in schools, for example, if teachers are worried, they can all get vaccinated um, to protect themselves. And I don't think we should be imposing measures on children to protect other populations when those measures might be harmful to the children themselves. So it sounds like your advice to parents is don't rush into it, hold off. Uh, how much how much information, how much time should parents uh, take into consideration? If it's that low of a risk, it, it, I mean, it's, it's it, I guess it, if uh, it's, it's what you're saying. It's an individual parent's decision, and it shouldn't necessarily be a mandate. Is that correct? Uh, I, I, if it were up to me, I would leave it up to parents, um, and I would give them as much information as possible. You know, right now you can't vaccinate kids under 12. If you're the parent of a boy who's in the 12 to 17 range, based on the incidence of myocarditis in that group. Um, I would be extremely cautious about getting my son vaccinated because the risk of myocarditis, while it's not often serious, um, is not insignificant. Uh, so I, I just, I think you got to give parents lots of information and let parents make the decision because from an epidemic management perspective, it's not going to make much difference. Very high percentages of kids have already been infected. And so they've got adaptive immunity. And frankly, the research is showing that that 
immunity from infection is probably at least as strong, if not stronger, than people are getting from the vaccines. So I, I just, you know, I have nothing against vaccines. I'm vaccinated. I just got my booster this week and spent a couple of days of not feeling great from the from the booster. And I generally encourage people who have any risk to, you know, they they should talk to their doctor, but I generally think there's nothing wrong with getting vaccinated. Kids is a different story because the risk uh, benefit calculation is, is different. And I, I, I don't like the idea of forcing kids to get vaccinated. I just view it as probably unnecessary. Uh, you mentioned uh, boys between the age of 12 and, and 17 cases of myocarditis. Uh, I'm going to ask because I don't know what myocarditis is, and I'm sure people who are going to listen to this are going to ask the same question. What, what is that? Are they going to try to Google it? What, what is that? It's a, it's a heart inflammation. Um, and it's, it's occurred in adults too. They, they're not sure why it, it happens frankly with, um, with coronavirus disease somewhat frequently, typically mild. Um, some cases are a little more serious and, and require hospitalization. Um, something about the vaccine, you know, the spike protein itself that's in the vaccines, something's triggering inflammation, triggers inflammation in other tissues too, but obviously anything that's affecting your heart is a particular uh, concern. And I don't want to unduly alarm people, but again, the risk to children is so small from the disease that I, I just think, you know, you got to weigh um, what the benefits versus what the risks may be. Earlier on, you brought up the, the, the fact that certain states are doing better than other states when it comes to coronavirus cases and, and deaths. Um, have there been any noticeable trends or similarities between the states that are doing better and, and worse? Um, and, and, and also, I think you've mentioned that the reporting from a lot of state health agencies hasn't been the best either. So there's a lot of states seem to be doing things differently and it doesn't all seem to, to quite add up. Yeah, so on the data side, I think it's generally true that most states have done a pretty poor job of giving people really good, useful information. Some states, my state, uh, Minnesota, is definitely one of them, have been far more interesting in using the data, um, what data is presented, how it's presented uh, to support their messaging than to just give people full and accurate data and, and let people understand what's going on. So, yeah, I'm not overly impressed uh, with the data. In terms of overall response, um, I think some states have had a little more balance than other states. You know, we've just had this obsession with the epidemic as though it's the only thing that matters. And I do think some states, and I'll point to Florida, and some countries, and you can look at Sweden as a great example of this, have had more of an appreciation that, look, some of these measures we take have bad health implications for people. We scare people into not going to the doctor who really need to go, and now we're seeing heart attack deaths increase or diabetes um, deaths increase because people missed health care that they needed. I mentioned the educational deficits that were, that were creating. So I think there are states that had a little more of an attitude of, look, I'm supposed to be looking out for the overall public health and the overall welfare of the people who live in my state. Um, and I, I think that's commendable because it wasn't easy to do that. If you did that, you got beat up by the press and you got beat up by other people. But in my judgment, you were doing the right thing because you were trying to do what was in the best interest of all of the people you're responsible for. So, so what what should we as the public be demanding of our our leaders, whether it's political or health health department leaders? Um, what 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 should we be demanding from them 
being able to handle COVID from which, as you say, is here and is staying from this point on. <laughs> well, something you're never going to see from a politician, which is courage and integrity, right? Um, you know, I think the willingness to make decisions and take heat, not be afraid of people saying, oh, you're letting people get sick and blah, 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 when there are other things uh, to be be considered. Um, as I just mentioned, I, I think, you know, the public has a right to full information. You're, you're in the media business. You know, the function of that, it's not so much people being free to say whatever they want. People have a right to hear the truth. And especially when the government in, is involved, they have a right to the truth. And so we ought to get every scrap of data that governments have and be able to analyze it on our own and to then, like I do, say, hey, here's what I see. Um, so I, I think that would be critical. Um, but as I said before, if we're going to get out of this, there needs to be an attitude shift. We need to stop obsessing about it and thinking it's the only thing that matters. It, it isn't. And it's not that threatening at this point. I think we've done pretty much what we can. And it's pretty much under control. And so, frankly, we, we need to move on. Uh, we're getting close to wrapping it up here. Uh, two questions. Um, I, my wife and I, my son had COVID uh, last Christmas and I had to spend a Zoom Christmas away from family members. And quite honestly, it, it, it sucked. So uh, what are your recommendations for the general public coming into Thanksgiving and into Christmas? Because I've already seen the reports out there from certain experts saying, hey, you just need to stay home and not go out. I'm not planning to do that, but again, want to be aware of, I've got relatives who are over 65, over 70, over 80 years of age. Uh, what precautions do we need to do uh, to have a happy family gatherings at both Thanksgiving and at Christmas over the holidays? Well, I, I think the most obvious thing is what you did. If you're sick or have been sick recently, then, you know, the right thing to do is isolate yourself from people just in case you're infectious. Uh, absent that, as I said earlier, I encourage people to live your life. You, you know, you don't, you don't live forever, no matter what, and you, you need to enjoy what makes it worth being alive. So I'm, you know, here in Minnesota, last Thanksgiving and Christmas, they were telling people, oh, don't get together. And I thought that was horrific advice. You know, if you observe basic cautions, there's absolutely no reason why people shouldn't be getting together. And and so, you know, I tell people, don't pay any attention to the so-called experts who tell you, you you shouldn't get together with your family at Christmas. If somebody's sick, they should be careful. But other than that, um, I enjoy your life. All right, folks, we're getting ready to wrap this up. We're here with Mr. Kevin Roche. He's got the Healthy Skeptic uh, website, healthy-skeptic.com. Uh, Kevin, let's just wrap this up with asking, you know, why did you start the blog? Why did you start posting the stuff you've done? What have you been able to accomplish with it? What have you been happiest of what it's been able to to do and you know what things would you like to see it be able to do or, or what other things would you like to be able to see the message go out and, I, and again i would recommend folks we do rep reprint some of the stuff on chatham journal website but also feel free to go on there and you pretty much put something out just about every day on that site and there's there's lots of good content and, and you go to the sources for some of those medical studies with a capsule explanation of, hey, here's why this study is important. Um, and I actually asked you a question about some of the stats about, uh, you know, hospitalizations versus deaths and everything else like that. And, and you've got that content on your website. Yeah. So actually, you know, the blog's been around for 15 years. It's just a sleepy little 
healthcare research and policy blog. And um, uh, when the epidemic started, I didn't have any intention of writing about coronavirus until we started doing lockdowns and school closings. And I was like, well, wait a minute, we've never done anything like this before for flu epidemics that were frankly just as, as bad. Um, and why are we doing this now? And it's going to cause enormous kind of collateral damage. So I started writing primarily because of that. And then I realized as I looked around for sources of information that in Minnesota in particular, there was no place that people could go to to kind of just get basic data about what a case curves look like, what a hospitalization rates look like, what's the aid structure, um, all kinds of interesting data. And so I started putting together charts and, and information like that. And I also realized that people probably weren't aware there's this immense body of research that's being conducted about the epidemic and that, you know, to have some of that knowledge summarized might be helpful for people. As far as the future goes, I just soon stop writing about this. And I intend to as soon as uh, as I can, because I, again, I, you know, I'm happy to go back to what life was kind of like before. But in the meantime, you know, I, I think I've, I've acquired an audience of people who do appreciate having access to data and, and science that helps them make up their own minds about what they think the appropriate policy is. Well, folks, that's Mr. Kevin Roche giving us a wrap up here. I appreciate him being on. On, Feel free to reach out and take a look at his website. Again, we do run stories on the Chatham Journal website that we do re reprint. That's, again, the, the Minnesota stuff that's Minnesota specific, we kind of take a stay away from. But I think the stuff that you've recently been putting out on kids and, and how it affects them so much more. It seems like the lockdowns and the masks and everything else has had more of a negative effect than COVID has on that that age group. Is uh, is that kind of a, a good way to wrap things up? Yes, I think that's true. All right, folks, thank you very much. And for watching, we'll also have a follow-up story on the Chatham Journal. And Mr. Kevin, thank you very much.